Okay. Oh. Do you want this one or? Uh, you have to say before I read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> reading, reading, reading the body language, I think, yes, I think I want this one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes I'm too patient with myself when it comes to lapses in practice, i.e., never mind, you'll return to it. Do you think torpor can mask itself as patience? Oh. Is there a kind responder to you? Sure. Yeah. So, I think. Patience is an incredibly important and irreplaceable quality, but it's not an ultimate value, if that makes sense for me. It's always weaved into more, you know. It's weaved with, or it should be, or can be weaved with a greater, or with a great aspiration, and with a sense of urgency and kind of being ardent and precise, you know. So it's part of a mix, if that makes sense. And patience can be seen as Ease, you know, described mostly in terms of ease, but it can also be described in terms of kind of enduring and um, being. I don't know if enduring is the right word. I don't have the right English for it, maybe. But kind of being really willing to meet all sorts of things in the direction of what feels helpful and important. So with these kind of questions, I would look at the balance between yes, patience but also a sense of urgency, and a sense of like, yeah, and also, and also a sense of feeling empowered to meet one's own difficulties. I think maybe that will be my kind of, the linchpin I would, I would look at. If patience in the moment makes me feel more empowered to move forward, then it's well balanced. If it makes me feel like, ah, fine, you know, then I would suspect it's, it could be torpor, it could be inertia, you know, which is a huge issue you know, for, I think, everyone all the time. So, yeah, patience, I think, I think the sense of empowerment would, for me, be, be an interesting indicator. Um, yeah, I really want to hear what you think, but that fits the cause yeah, of, of trying to... Then we have double the questions. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I think that's a great response. Please can you say more about the overzealous and well-intended but demanding mind that so wants to be patient and self-compassionate but essentially fails? (laughs) Thank you. So this is definitely related to the last question, I would say, and wanting to be patient... Now (laughs) is actually a sign of impatience. And it's also a sign that we are um, buying into this idea of the self as an agent that can make things happen according to our own time scale, according to our wants. So none of the path unfolds through wanting. There's a big difference between wanting and aspiration. Wanting is tanha, it means like thirst, like desire, and it's predicated on a sense of lack, most often. Whereas aspiration is closer to inspiration and confidence, a sense of meaning in, uh, in allowing the practice to take its own time. When we have a real sense of conviction, and a real sense of purpose with the practice, that is enough to sustain our interest. For the long term, we don't need to push ourselves, we don't need to um, make ourselves go and meditate. It's much better to encourage ourselves gently and to put the causes in place. Um, so yeah, of course, we want to be self-compassionate, we want to be patient, but uh, really it's about asking what would it take to invite more compassion into my mind, invite more patience into my life. Um, and then put the causes in place. And I would just contend with this idea that you essentially fail. It's so easy to notice the times that you're not patient. I think Yael said earlier that patience is a sort of quiet and fairly shy being that's much less visible. Most of the time, we're actually being patient. 
we're allowing things to happen, we're being engaged in the moment with kindness, with care, but we usually notice when that ends, you know, because suffering arises as soon as the patience is lost. So count the times you're patient. See if you can notice when you are patient, and that will give you much more encouragement than noticing when you're not. You can see how old I am. <laughs> when I try and accept different feelings or emotions, I feel as though I'm trying um, still to trick my body into removing this, into removing these. When I try and accept difficult feelings or emotions, I feel as though I'm trying to trick my body into removing these rather than accepting. How can I something through? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can't read that last word, sorry. Thanks very much. Um, so if I understand correctly, there is a racial intention to really accept, to really receive, to really allow, and it feels like actually there is a little bit of aversion kind of in the background, and actually the kind of <coughs> some level what the mind is trying to do is to push the feeling or emotion away, and then the question, what can one do about it? Um, I think I have a few responses. Actually, there are a few possibilities. Um, one thing that you can do is just add more ways in which you can soften and expand the mind. Make the mind really, really broad, make the mind really wide, focus on the change of things, and give it time. You know, give it time. There is a momentum of something in the being, and if you're trying to, or when you're trying to kind of counter that momentum with allowing or letting go, it, it may really take time for it to kind of get hold, and there will be a time in which both momentums will be active. You know? So one response is kind of try a bit more, a few more ways to allow the letting go, to expanding, observing the change, softening the body, and be patient with it. Give it time, you know, and, and it will kind of, it will, the dynamic will change. And that's one response. Another response, another possibility. Trying to allow, and it feels, hmm, um, another thing you can do is actually focusing on a simpler level of the emotion or the mental state, all right? Mental states and emotions have a few levels to them. At one level, it will be just an uneasy feeling in the body. And you just welcome that. You don't welcome the whole constellation. You don't welcome the whole kind of constellation of anger, including the story, including the anger to oneself. You, you can't handle that right now. You just welcome the, the uneasy, the kind of unpleasant sense in the body there. That's it. And that can do the whole difference. You know? That's much easier to welcome. And that can do the whole, the whole thing or, or a big part of it. Um, another possibility. You may need to pause before you welcome and recognize. I'm experiencing this. It's hard. You know. It's hard to experience this. These are the emotions that are around. Kind of a bit more recognition to what's around, and then when it's recognized, then it can be welcomed. Does this make sense? It's like using the intercoms and who's there, you know, or now you're welcomed, but more seriously, you know, really giving it time. I'll pause here. So far, we've discussed patience in more mundane day-to-day -day contexts such as traffic or queues, where there's no human hostility. But how can you apply patience and compassion in interpersonal conflicts when someone is hostile? How would you approach patience and compassion if someone is directing painful hatred, contempt or discrimination at you or a loved one? Yeah. That is 
not an easy answer and not an easy situation and a very painful situation to endure. And as we've been saying, patience is not just enduring. I think in this context, patience can also be a means to trying to find a wise solution to this, a solution that is going to lessen the harm because the per- person perpetrating harm, whether intentional or unintentional, and especially if intentional, right? sometimes we can perceive that, but it's not actually happening, and I'm not saying that's the case here, but if this is happening, and if it is intentional, then that person is harming themselves. So sometimes I think patience might be um, a skillful attitude to gently remove oneself, take a step back from a situation, and give yourself a time to assess what needs to be done. The Buddha said there are different ways to overcome resentment, and perhaps this is what's you know, being directed at you, or, or more likely resentment is a response that can arise, a kind of hardening of the mind. And uh, the first two were love and kindness and compassion. Okay, but these include yourself. It doesn't only mean having loving kindness and compassion to the person who's hostile. It, can, it also includes you. So that loving kindness can be a protection for you, but sometimes it can also be um, a way that you develop the confidence to actually do what's in your best interest, which might mean walking away. Right? So another one of the, um, the tools that the Buddha uses for overcoming resentment is equanimity. Realizing that there is change here, it's not always going to be like this, that people won't always speak kindly to us, etc. And developing a certain level of acceptance to that. But interestingly, the fourth one is to ignore the person. And I like to use this one, I like to mention it, because sometimes if people are stuck in abusive relationships and there is a way out, I'm not saying there always is, especially if it's a family member, but if there is, it's perfectly valid to leave, it's perfectly okay to walk away, as long as it's safe, right? So the development of all these qualities together will be a protection. The loving kindness will keep you safer from that hostility and maybe also less affected by it. You might remember the simile of the salt that uh, Yahel used earlier of, um, in a sense, widening or expanding our capacity, widening um, or deepening the resilience of the mind. Um, And this is done very skillfully through loving kindness practice. The mind literally becomes great. It goes to greatness, mahagata. Buddha called it, it becomes boundless and expansive. And even in meta practice sometimes, if you start with a loved person or an easy person, you might find that when you're resourced, a difficult person will just happen to come along when you least expect it and almost enter that stream of meta. And at that time, because the mind is wide and soft and resourced, sometimes it hardly has any impact at all. And this was my experience once without even trying to intentionally include the difficult person. It was a person who actually physically abused me several years ago, and they were very close to me, so it really shook my world. But when my mind was resourced, it was as though it was ready, and that difficult person came in. So even if you do feel you have to walk away, it doesn't mean you don't have to care. You can, as Ajahn Brown says, love the tiger from a distance and keep on developing your own patience and compassion within. So... I hope that gives a few ideas because I don't know the exact details of the situation. Okay. Could you expand on the metaphor or imagery of spaciousness and giving space in the heart? Also, is this something the Buddha referred to or a useful newer term? Mm, interesting thinking. So the metaphor of using space. Um, Generally, we refer to space in two ways. One space in terms of space, and one space, or two space in terms of time, interestingly. But let's talk about space in terms of space, uh, or space in terms of, kind of physicality. Actually, it can be quite kind of kinesthetic. You're feeling something, and something, or 
and if it's uneasy, if there is something painful or difficult, and things, kind of painful or difficult things arise all the time in small ways, right? Just moment to moment, something is a bit painful, and actually the awareness tends to shrink. That is part of what I would say constellates the kind of basic movement of clinging or craving. The awareness shrinks somehow. And that shrinking is itself unpleasant, and it locks you into the relationship with that thing that the awareness has shrunk around, right? If you enter into a room and there's a person you don't like, that's the first person you're going to see, right? And the awareness is going to shrink on that, and the reactivity is going to activate. It's going to be kind of activated with regard to them, and that's going to color your perception. And that same logic works when you're attending to your whole body, or to your experience moment to moment, the awareness tends to get locked into what is more agitating, less pleasant, and it does that kind of habitually and with a little bit of aversion in it, usually. So the thing about giving some space is actually quite kind of simple in this way. Um, it's the invitation to let the attention or the awareness be a bit more wide, to include more. You know, like now you're looking at me, see if you can expand your gaze so you're seeing more of what's around. You know, it's just a matter of doing this. So you can do that with your physical eyes or you can do that with your attention. You're giving attention to something and you're learning to do this. And then there is a bit more around. And you can stretch it, expand much more, and actually take your awareness and you can try it right now and see if you can feel the whole room. As if you're taking in the entire room, what's in front, what's behind, what's to the side, and you're actually feeling it. You know? So that's the invitation around space. Does this make sense when I say that? Uh, in terms of the Buddha referring to that, I don't remember, and you can correct me, I think you're much more expert than me in Buddha's uh, teachings, but I don't remember him referring to that kind of expansion in the way I spoke about right now. There are some references to kind of boundlessness uh, in some ways, and there is the invitation to give attention to space. But my perception of what he means, or my understanding of what he means when he says to give attention to space, is actually slightly different than what I described and has to do more with. Um, there is me the dissolving of the sense of materiality, which basically is slightly harder to do, <laughs> uh, but and slightly different. So that'll be my understanding. Yeah. Okay. My mood and energy um, has varied a lot since being here. An impulse decision I made on Wednesday. I noticed a huge lift in mood when I let myself find out the election result. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, if contextual and underlying... <clears throat> create the conditions for our mind, how do we discern what is a wise action? Something my phone, <laughs> if you're looking at your phone or something, versus um, uh, habitual reactions? Or how do we allow, oh gosh. You can ask the person, if the person wants to, just ask it. Yeah, maybe that would be better. Would anybody feel, with the person who wrote this, would they feel confident to actually uh, ask it in person? Because it is a bit tricky for me at this point. <laughs> yeah, hi. hi, it's my eyes, it's not your eye no, It's a combination, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, so, so my question is, if there's contextual factors that are um, impacting, that you can't, in fact, you're kind of aware of it, and then you know if you do a thing, it's going to make things settled. You can go to what your own more, more personal thing. 
but how do you discern whether or not it's a, a wise action or just habitual? So I'm going to right, right, right. that is a habitual reaction. And the other thing I suppose was when I did look at the phone, it's actually after the meta practice. And it felt like I'm just going to do this and look. And then that felt kind of everything eased off mm -hmm. and other things went into more flow. Yeah. So it's just like how do you know that, yeah. that kind of yeah, it's more hardcore. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can always know. Sometimes, so much of the path is an experiment, and it's learning over time what kind of actions lead to the wholesome states increasing. Also, over time, so something that is you know helpful and useful and beneficial in one moment might not be useful and beneficial all of the time. So, if you would then think, okay, well, I can keep looking at my phone because, you know, it helped me at that point, you might find that it doesn't have that effect next time. It actually starts to drain the mind. So I think one way is to differentiate between things that are pleasant and beneficial, perhaps, in the moment, and the things that are going to lead to lasting benefit throughout our lives, such as virtue, which is something that might not always feel good at the time. It might involve a sense of restraint, but over time, it gives us a sense of inner integrity. It gives us a sense of... Um, our lives being on the right track, we're living a values aligned life that we feel good about and we can reflect on and bring up joy towards. Um, but I think another way that I sort of tend to at least try to um, distinguish this in the beginning is intention. You know, what is the intention behind looking at the phone? You know, am I looking at the phone to do some kind of guided meditation? Am I looking at the phone because I'm distracted and feeling upset or not to say that that's necessarily wrong because like you know in this case you've got some very good news in your perception <laughs> I can't say whether I agree or not but I'm laughing too <laughs> so um, yeah I think if it doesn't involve like actually breaches of our ethical behavior it's okay to experiment a little bit and to use a bit of trial and error to find out That's okay. I'm not usually this bad. What role does humour play in the teaching? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah. I don't know. I think we're kind of funny, aren't we? You're, you're kind of funny. You're funny. Fun. Yeah, definitely. So that's the best You know? Um, I think, I think, in a way, it's one can use it as one of the indicators, again, for, for, to, to check if the mind has got into a kind of a loop of addiction or, or inertia. Mm -hmm. If the mind, and maybe it just refers to the last question, maybe, maybe other things as well, when the mind is in a mix of kind of a little bit of addiction or, or inertia, not necessarily addiction that needs to be like very apparent, but just kind of in a habitual kind of, you know, mm -hmm. um, there is not much humor. And if there is the possibility to bring some level of humor in it, it brings a little bit of like, huh, it's, it has another angle, it, it has like a reflective space. In a way, it has a little bit to do with seeing what we can call the emptiness of something. It's seeing that something that felt so rigid and real and stuck and kind of, that's the way it has to be. Now, humor kind of, assuming that it's genuine humor, not cynicism, or not kind of, you know, enjoying the, the suffering of others or anything of that sort, but genuine humor, it kind of brings a little bit of a different perspective to the thing. And I think a lot in the Dharma has to do with bringing different perspectives to the thing. You know, so I think humor is a good, good indicator for it, if that makes sense. However, I don't know, I haven't thought of a way, I haven't found a way to kind of systematize it. Does this make sense? So I don't know how to lean on it as a kind of practice, but it's a kind of indicator or result, or it can kind of tell you more or less where you are in terms of how reified and rigid and kind of fixed things are, and how much freedom of movement there is around. Are you available for humor, you know, even if you're not funny at the moment, but are you available to look in a humoristic way? Well, it was funny sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Well, 
What's really funny is when teachers are very kind of serious and they're all of a sudden they just say something and people are just crack. Sometimes the teachers themselves just start laughing almost with tears. And I've definitely lost my humour along the way, you know, say with the project when it's just going, it's really difficult. And I've noticed I just don't seem to laugh anymore. And once I went to a Jerome and told him this and he just started laughing, <laughs> really laughing to the point he was actually crying with laughter. <laughs> and it was just so hilarious. I just started, of course, laughing as well. It was remarkable how he could just pick it up as a tool and, and kind of convey that sense of lightness and, uh, yeah, spaciousness around the issue. It was wonderful. <laughs> anyway, when should you stop being patient... And quit or leave or end something, how do you decide? Yeah. I mean, that's a huge question and there can't be one answer, so I'm trying to wriggle out of it already. <laughs> should I just stop? And what do you say? How, how should you decide when to just stop being patient and leave something? Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. When should you stop being patient? I think if you feel that you need to stop being patient, you've probably already gone beyond your capacity because patience shouldn't feel hard. It shouldn't feel tiring to the mind. Genuine patience is this allowing quality. It's an acceptance. It's a, a welcoming. Remember the candidate example I gave you of someone coming to ordain. They don't say, will you put up with me? Will you stick, stick it through no matter what? They say, will you accept me into the Sangha? Will you welcome me? And this is for the long run, too. So patience is very, very gentle. And the people I know who show the most patience are immensely gentle. Like, they just come into a room and everybody relaxes. It's like they come in almost invisibly. There's a sense of humility and a lack of um, imposition. You know, they don't impose on the, on the situation in any way. My own teacher sometimes walks into a room and, you know, he's the big guy, right? He's the big Ajahn. And there's a seat there for him, which is obviously for him, but he'll say, where should I sit? <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I'll thank you. <laughs> it's just so sweet. So I think if um, the patience is starting to really test you and really stretch you, then it might be time to bring perhaps more love into the patience, perhaps more... Um, resourcing, perhaps more wisdom. Um, yeah, how do you know when to quit or leave something? I mean, if you've really tried for a long period of time and you're losing your passion for it, I think that's another way to quit. I was sharing with you hell earlier today that I went through like a full-on burnout during this uh, developing a monastery in the UK for women. And I think by then, a lot of people would have just thought enough is enough. And there were many times leading to that, that for months, like from every single day for months, I would have immense doubt. But the thing that I realized, especially when uh, there was some health news that was worrying to me, and I wasn't sure how long I might have to live, should this health news be quite, you know, advanced, um, I realized that I really have a lot of passion and love and belief in, this, in what I'm doing. And this made me realize I wanted to do it for the sheer love of it, for the sheer meaning and purpose that it gave to me. And that was quite a surprise to me, because often it did feel like just trolling, you know, kind of trudging through and sometimes pushing something. I used to say not up a hill, but up a kind of steep cliff, you know. Just. Mm. But I don't know, I think you need to resource yourself along the way to stop from time to time, to rest. You know, but then see if this is something that's really, really worth your energy and efforts. Don't give up too easily. Um, but, I mean, another reflection that came to me at that time was, if I didn't have long to live, would this still be a priority? Yeah. How would I choose to spend the rest of my time? So that might be another uh, question you can ask, perhaps. Mm. If you are talking about an abusive relationship, I would say... Um, yeah, you know, when the suffering starts to uh, to be more than the actual joy and the, the happiness that it brings, then, yeah, and if it's harming you, if it's actually affecting the quality of your mind. Another sign can be friends in that case, because we don't always see it ourselves, we're so enmeshed. 
But someone very close to me was in, I think, an abusive relationship. And all her friends and family around her told her this. And it took a very, very long time. But it was, it, it did play a factor. It did play a part because it was everybody unanimously. So sometimes we need to check in with our friends as well. is for you. <clears throat> yeah, hell, you offered four possibilities before lunch, and I observed my mind desperately trying to remember their exact instructions. Then you invited us to share one or two. Share, so us to, sorry. Then you invited us to choose one or two, and my mind began scurrying about, weighing and judging which would be right for me. This is typical of my experience, always checking, is this right? Should I use breath? Or maybe sensation of the ground or the sky's boundary? Or the skin boundary, sorry. I won't put these on. I can't tell sometimes if it's the writing or the size. <laughs> okay. Or meta practice. <laughs> yeah, we're giving you a lifetime's worth of practices in like one and a half days. Uh, what of chanting? <laughs> and you're adding more. Perhaps I should do that, but at the beginning or at the end? That felt peaceful and pleasant, but what it, was it samadhi? What should I do, more or less of, to make that come about, etc.? I recognize this as doubt. How can patience help me to work with doubt? Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for the person who asked. Um, so basically, um, I hope it's okay that I actually won't respond directly to the last question, but I will respond to the rest of it, if that's fine, you know, the whole kind of text. Because the last question is kind of, in a way, much more general, and I want to refer to what feels very relevant there. So, I have a few responses, as we know. Um, one, I think for most people, it's helpful to choose an orientation for their practice for a while. Right? A month of, two months of, some weeks of. Right? I think that's generally a good advice to have for your practice back home. You know? I think it's much more effective to have a month of X rather than switching between different things kind of constantly, day by day, kind of random guided meditation, etc. You know? So that's a very general thing. Now, which line to choose? Basically the one that feels intuitively I want that and then your job is to stick with it. Right? It doesn't matter so much. Everything in the Dharma supports everything else. And it's very often that people hear something and say, yeah, I need exactly that. I really need metta. I really need samadhi. I really need insight. And you're probably right. And you're really, you really need all of it. But you just need to start somewhere and trust that that thing that you're choosing is actually going to help with all the other things. You know? and, and it will. It will. And it will work much better if you just stick to it. Now, another point on it, uh, because things can be a little bit confusing sometimes. It's good to have, it's good and it's rare to have some distinction of what's small and what's big. Like, what's the bigger category that the practice is sitting in? All right? So, the practices I offered this afternoon. The first practice of kind of breath and whole body, you know, it falls into the category of samadhi. It's a kind of samadhi. The other practices are kinds of insight practices. Does this make sense? And more specifically, there are kinds of insight practices that focus on the experience of pushing and pulling, cleaning and craving, and relate to it in some ways. Now, why is that helpful to know that? Because you do want to choose the direction, but you don't want it to be too narrow. Does this make sense? It's better to choose the direction that's kind of, it's mid-size, 
I'm doing this style of emptiness or um, insight practices, and maybe the, the allowing and the sensing, cleaning, relaxing, and it's a kind of style of doing it, or I'm doing samadhi mostly based on breath and body, but with all these, when, when you have the slightly broader category or the mid-range category, it means that you have some room to play with some other things, right? You're going for samadhi, breath and whole body, and you bring a little bit of metta as a natural part of that practice. Or you sometimes sense into the clinging and relax it, but you know what's your main line. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? I mean, it's, not, it's not necessarily very, like, it's not trivial. You need to kind of figure out a little bit what the teacher means and figure it out all the time. But that would be generally my response. Yes? So, finding what intuitively feels right, maybe distinguishing the kind of mid-size category, you know, maybe samadhi, maybe insight, maybe meta, and this kind of technique helps, more or less, and then trying to stick with it and allow yourself some edges to play with other things that come along in terms of inspiration or dealing with issues that come up in practice. I hope that was helpful. Uh, But I'm um, just uh, reading a few at a time to see if some might have similar themes and we can put them together. But uh, I think this one might relate to some of what has just been said. Could you please sh- give some recommendations on how to work skillfully with chronic pain? Thank you very much. With a heart. <laughs> Yeah, it's not easy to work with chronic pain and it could be the case that the chronic pain is aggravated in certain postures or it could be the case that the chronic pain is there no matter what. So those two situations are quite different. And in the case where it is being aggravated by a sitting posture or um, even a walking posture perhaps, then I would say try to find a different position that alleviates it as much as you possibly can. So the first thing to do is to be as kind and as gentle and take off as much pressure from your body as you can so that you're not exacerbating the condition. Um, And this is okay. The Buddha himself, when he uh, went for full enlightenment, or maybe he didn't know right then he was going to be fully enlightened, but he actually took some grass and sat under the roots of the Bodhi tree. He didn't just sit on the hard, bony roots. He'd done austerities for so many years and he found it led him nowhere. And I think often in, um, I don't know if it's all cultures, but certainly in in cultures, non-Buddhist cultures, maybe more capitalistic societies where there's so much pressure and demand and we're living very stressful lives, we tend to be very ascetic, believe it or not. Yes, there's a lot of sensory indulgence too, but we tend to really push ourselves too hard. So I would say as far as possible, um, try to be very gentle with your body, move more often if you need to, um, change your posture more often if you need to. However, if this chronic pain is, uh, and also even in this case, the chronic pain will persist uh, because it's chronic, (laughs) then firstly, this sounds a bit counterintuitive, but it's partly because of your note. You had a little love heart and it said, thank you very much. And I thought, isn't that a beautiful attitude to extend to your pain? Can you do that? Can you thank the pain for being there? Can you open up to what it might have to teach you? Because in my experience, at least, sometimes suffering, whether physical or emotional, can be a window to great insight and a window to compassion. So if there is a lot of pain, then you might want to try experimenting with the way you relate to that pain and see how much um, rejection, how much aversion, how much fear is being added there. And see if instead, in that space, if you like, this is just a metaphor, but say there's a space between your pain and the mind that's watching. See if you can add more kindness and compassion in that space. See if you can notice how you're relating, first of all. 
Sometimes also, as uh, Yahel was saying, we can actually work more spatially. So if you find your mind becoming pulled into it time and again, because we do have this negativity bias that's been proved by psychologists, you know, doing research on the way the brain works, we have this bias towards what's difficult because we perceive it sometimes as a genuine threat to our survival, even when it's not, right? This is why anxiety is such a huge epidemic as well. Um, so to try to counter that, we can move our awareness or expand our awareness to other parts of the body so that we're not running away from the chronic pain. It's still there, but it's kind of in the background and your field of awareness is much wider, that it contains much more. Other times we can actually deliberately incline ourselves to the parts of the body or the feelings of the body which are pleasant, which are not in chronic pain. And some examples of this are like the palms of the hands, maybe the skin, unless it's a chronic skin condition, <laughs> or you've got arthritis or something. But, you know, maybe the, the skin or the soles of the feet, these can be areas that are quite neutral, maybe quite pleasant, and you can just rest your attention there. And then from time to time, have a look again at the chronic pain, you know, include it. But don't make it the centre of your awareness, because that way your energy, your attention will get sucked in. Um, another way that I've worked with pain in meditation, which has mostly been um, due to long sittings, but also due to sciatic pain, and this works best if we have a level of mindfulness, first of all. So our mindfulness is pretty well established and we're feeling quite autonomous, quite spacious, if you like, quite content, quite at ease, emotionally, mentally, with the pain. We can actually purposely start to go into that pain and examine it through a lens of impermanence to actually see how what we call pain, what we label as pain, is a whole mass of different sensations that are changing constantly. You know, what is pain actually? Pain is a label, pain is a concept. What is it made up of? Maybe there's heat there, maybe there's piercing feelings, maybe there's um, tingling, maybe there's throbbing. There might be all kinds of different feelings. But we're, you know, when we say this is pain, we go into the reactive mode, I don't want it, so quickly that we don't actually have a chance to examine it more closely. So sometimes that can then become really interesting. But as I said, it requires um, quite a bit of stability and balance in the mind. So I would suggest probably resourcing the mind first through practices like loving kindness or metta, being really gentle, being really spacious. And when you feel ready, you can just go in even for a short time and just have a look at the nature of that pain. See if it's quite as solid as you thought. But please don't do this if sitting longer and staying longer will actually exacerbate the physical aspect. The, you know, the, the, um, if there is a kind of aspect that is physical, is degenerative, and sitting for longer would affect that, then please be very, very gentle with yourself. So these are a few ideas. Yeah. But I wasn't kidding when I said thank the pain for being there. Because it's teaching you about suffering and it's teaching you to connect with other people who are in pain. If you can really understand the nature of pain and how it feels to, you know, to have the wholesome and unwholesome reactions to that, how, how difficult it can be, then you can also help others with their chronic pain as well. So it has a meaning. It's not in vain. What if we have not received tender loving care from our mother when we were little. She might be emotionally unavailable or disconnected due to her own conditioning regarding postpartum depression. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, yeah, that's a big question. Really appreciate it. I would think of these things as a spectrum. Yeah. And sometimes on that spectrum, there, there is the feeling or the sense that there wasn't much there. I would say this if a person can meditate, then definitely there is enough resource there in order to build things really, really well. It's probably the case that even if they can't, there is enough resource there in order to build things really, really well. 
under the right conditions. But even if you had a sense of that there wasn't much there in terms of care, in terms of love, but now you have the possibility of, to be with your experience in a way that feels generally helpful, you know, in this kind of environment, if you can tolerate what's going on, then I would say there is a lot there in terms of resource and in terms of capacity. It's really not a trivial thing to be able to be here, eyes closed, or walk, do the walking meditation, and having it leading in a, in a helpful direction, generally, of course, not all the time, but generally, that's already huge, and that means you have tons of resources, tons. Um, I really mean that, I really, really mean that. So you can really trust that and build from there, you know, and through the constant attunement to yourself, through the sensing of how are things right now and what do they need, through the care and the love that's given in the meditation, one can slowly find and develop a kind of motherly function within themselves, towards themselves. That's very real. You know, it really, really can happen in meditation. And you don't have to be a genius to do it. You just need to ask yourself what's going on right now and what can I do that can help and learn more and more you know, through your experience. Um, I think it's tremendously important and I'm very happy that you're here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you say something about the wise limits of patience? How we can know this limit has been reached and another strategy is needed. Maybe this depends on how we define patience, but I'm wondering about this. So I don't know if that has already been sort of touched upon. Do you yes. have anything more to say? Because I think I, I sort of... I thought that your answer was yeah. quite perfect. Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's much. But I think... So I'll, I'll emphasize something that I think was said, and I'll say it shortly. Um, no, actually I won't. Because I don't have a short way of doing it. And I think it's quite perfect. <laughs> okay. okay. The younger parts of me that didn't get the support she needed during the developmental years often dominates my life decisions and immediate responses today. How do I help that small part of me to trust adult me? Hmm. Yeah. I was really touched by your response to the last question, actually. Mm. And um, perhaps just following on from that, just recognizing that by being here, you're already giving yourself a lot of love. You've made a decision in good faith to give yourself one of the highest blessings you could ever receive, which is, even if you, you know, don't yet call it the Dhamma, even if it's not sort of verified in that way in your mind, it's a gift of peace, of silence, of the possibility to learn more about your mind, about why you're here, how you can contribute in a beautiful way how you can be a blessing to the world. It's, it's really beautiful. So, first of all, just taking heart from that. And yes, much of the way we've been brought up does colour and condition the life decisions that we make and our responses today. And seeing that that's the case is the first step. You know, when we can see that, we can bring more compassion towards ourselves. We realize that this isn't because of you know, anything wrong with me. It's not intrinsically who I am. This is conditioned. It's natural that I would be making these kind of decisions given that I didn't get the support I needed at that time. So when you can learn to empathize with yourself in that way, it already brings a lot of softness and care um, to yourself. I've noticed sometimes if I'm asking or sharing something like this with another person and they try to kind of fix it or... Um, they say something that indicates they don't really have that experience. Sometimes I feel really alone, and I ask myself at that time what I would have liked them to say, and can I say that to myself? And sometimes all I want a person to say is, that sounds hard, I understand. That must be really difficult for you. 
So when we can say this to ourselves, then it takes away that sort of sense of, oh gosh, I don't want to be this way, you know, it shouldn't be this way. It's like, no, it's this way and it's natural and it's okay. And how you can help that small part of you, I mean, that is one way, you know, because by doing that, you're actually saying to that little girl, you know, it's okay. Like, of course you feel um, alone. Of course you feel unsupported because you didn't get the support you needed at that time. And I think, you know, eventually we can learn to send metta to ourselves and even to the small parts of ourselves. I might do a metta meditation at the end that um, includes that, but it's also not always easy in the beginning. So I think for metta practice, I start with the easy person. Some people say you can't love anyone until you love yourself. If this was the case, where on earth would we begin? You know, love is love, it doesn't matter. The object to me is unimportant. Whatever elicits that feeling of care, it can be a plant, it can be an orchid. You know, I have a beautiful orchid at home and it doesn't look beautiful all the year, and most of the time it doesn't have any flowers. But I love it anyway, I give it that care. I just care for it because, you know, it's a nice thing to do, and then when it flowers, it's a bonus. I don't demand that it flowers in, in, on my time scale. So in the same way, just start with the meta practice, wherever it works. You can send loving kindness to a plant, to a pet, to a teacher, to a child, to your best friend. And eventually when you're resourced enough, you might find that you can just invite that small child that was you in, into the metta. But don't force it, because that becomes another demand. First of all, just really be open and, and see if you can empathize with yourself. And if you can, it also helps you to empathise with others. Other people might make life decisions and have responses that you find, you know, unskillful or that irritate you. But maybe they too didn't have, you know, good examples in their life. Maybe that's how their caregivers related to them. So then we can start to have more compassion for others as well when we realise that all of us are just, in a sense, doing the only thing that we can. Right? And that might be the best we can. Maybe the last question? <laughs> oh, it says me. <laughs> but I think you can also answer to this. Really? Uh, perhaps. Do you to take another one? Uh, and we'll just come okay. the last one? Sure. Yeah. It's uh, to do with a translation of patience. Mm. So I'll give you another one. Here we go. <laughs> How do I stop falling asleep during meditation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, well, the first thing I would look at is just the posture, you know, the physicality of the thing. Um, especially if you're new or, that, or if tiredness is very, really, very really strong, I would practice standing more, you know. I really love it that in sitting meditations there is one or two people that stands. You know, it shows a kind of... Because obviously, there's at least one or two people that are falling asleep, probably more, right? <laughs> and if you look around, and there, is, there are some people that stand, it's like, ah, you know, it shows a certain commitment. So I would, I would do standing meditation, or even alternate between sitting and standing. Um, I would emphasize walking. Walking meditation is fantastic. You know, sometimes it, there is the impression that sitting is kind of more... Kind of important because we're doing it together, but that's kind of a wrong impression, really. I feel that walking meditation is very, very helpful, and especially in lives in which there is so much sitting happening anyway, you know. So if you have half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half to practice in a in a day, in a normal day, having the possibility of doing it in walking can actually be really helpful, you know. Otherwise, it can sometimes feel like I'm doing something that's not really good for my body if I had another hour of sitting. But if I can do it in walking and really have that sort of meditation and respect that, that's, that's a serious thing. And I think it, it really deserves a lot of credit. So one thing I would emphasize the walking, besides that I would practice standing. Um, if I would sit, I would make sure that the hands are in place that doesn't pull my body down. You know, so sometimes this actually closes something down. I would put them here. If I'm on a chair, I would put them here. So things would be somewhat open. I would meditate with eyes open. Maybe try that. 
And if you're tired, they will tend to close and then you open them again. So I would do all these things. Beside that, I would choose meditation techniques that would tend to be more uplifting. Maybe scanning the body. You know? Both of us in the meditations that we offer, we started with a kind of body scan. You can just do that for the whole length of meditation. It gives the mind kind of a little bit of more movement versus one spot, especially if it's narrow, the mind, if, it, if it's very tired or it has a tendency for it, it will kind of shrink down and that, you know, that can make things harder. So, all these things in terms of posture, posture, and then choosing a way to practice that's a little bit uplifting. So maybe uh, the body scan or maybe the meta meditation. Meta can be very, very kind of energetic and opening. Um, so these will be kind of my first invitations. Um, I just realized the one that is addressed to me, I'm kind of touching on tomorrow, so I was looking for another meditation question that we haven't yet really um, addressed. Mm. This is a good one. <laughs> this is a huge one. So maybe we can both just say one thing or right. something. How do I know if I'm meditating correctly? <laughs> <laughs> The Buddha did actually have a little criteria. I think that was to know what's the dhamma, what the Dhamma is. Whatever leads to peace, whatever leads to disentanglement, whatever leads to effacement, whatever leads to the ceasing and fading away of things, this you can know is the Dhamma. Let's take the word peace, <laughs> because there's a lot there. And we're talking about peace in the long run. We're talking about peace with experience itself. We're not necessarily talking about peace as a mental state because that takes time. It takes time to cultivate. But anything that's moving in the direction of the wholesome states increasing and the unwholesome states, which means the things that create suffering for us, if they're slowly or maybe quickly decreasing over time and the time is the key here you can't come to a retreat and expect that you know all your kind of deeply ingrained patterns have changed unless i don't know if, if you do find that congratulations but that hasn't been my experience and i think with the more experienced practitioners we we understand that this path is long so but generally over the time if you find that you know you're developing more patience more equanimity towards the ups and downs of life, um, more kindness, your virtue is improving. You're more careful about your actions of body, speech and mind. This is a very good measure of whether the practice is working. And um, how do I know if I'm meditating correctly? If Generally, if you find that you're more tense at the end of a meditation than you were to begin with, then there's been some clinging there, there's been some aversion there. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. This is a learning process. I like to enter meditation more with the question of how can I understand my mind? What can I learn about the way my mind works? And just observe. So we learn on the job in a sense. So it's not always the case that if you have a so-called difficult or um, unpleasant meditation that you're not doing it right. This is just the nature of existence. It's the nature of the mind. It's not always going to be, you know, showing you beautiful states. Your body's not always going to be pleasant. You're not always going to be letting go. But over time, if you find that you're generally inclining to peace, you're inclining to goodness, to virtue, and developing more equanimity in day-to-day -day life, then your meditation is working. Another little way, sorry I'm speaking for too long, but one little way that um, my teacher shared with me was when he was just beginning his practice, actually his first retreat he went immensely deep. He was still a lay person, but he just had this propensity from who knows where to get into really deep meditation. And, um, but after a while, you know, the conditions were such that that wasn't possible for him anymore. And he said to this friend of his, you know, I don't think I'm really getting anywhere in my meditation, so I've given up. 
And I'm so grateful to this person who spoke to him because imagine if he'd given up, I, w- I wouldn't be here, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not the worst consequence. He wouldn't be <laughs> as free. <laughs> Um, but this friend of his said, basically, just have a look, you know, meditate for a short time and notice at the end of the meditation, are you a little bit more peaceful, a little bit more e- at ease than when you began? Don't look for kind of bright lights and rapture through the body and, you know, deep understanding of emptiness. Just notice if you're a little bit more at ease and at peace than before. I'm sure there's a lot more to say about that, though. How do you know if you're meditating correctly? Mm. I think I think that, that was kind of a perfect answer. I love that one bit. Um, I, I will end a bit. So here in the hall there are many different people with many different backgrounds, right? And some of us have been meditating for years and years, and some of us are really new to this, you know. To me, an important question or an interesting question that I ask myself and students with regard to their meditation practice is, are you, lear- are you learning something new? Are you working at the kind of... Are you meditating in a way that's teaching the mind a new skill or that's cultivating something important or that is new to you? Mm-hmm. Are you exploring something now? in your meditation. And this will have a huge kind of range of variations kind of, you know, from the beginning to kind of very late stages in one's meditation and between different people. But I think it's important. I see as a value over the years, and now I'm speaking actually especially for people with a little bit more experience, that your meditation will be really, that you feel like Huh, I'm actually exploring something new and interesting to me. I'm working at some edge here. Does this make sense when I say that? I think it, it definitely can be like that. Um, so yeah, I, I see meditation as an evolving, you know, an evolving journey. So to everything you said was more than valid, I'm just adding that. Oh, that's really wonderful, actually. Yeah. That's really wonderful, especially because we sometimes seem to measure success by how comfortable we are, mm. right? And actually that can be a kind of stagnation for the longer term practitioner. You get into your comfort zone, you sit down, you know what you're doing. You don't have the beginner's mind anymore. So that sense of, yeah, meeting something new, finding another way to, to view what's happening, another way to perceive, a skillful way to perceive that actually uh, brings more freedom into your life is another way to know that the practice is, is evolving. Yeah. I'll add one more thing, and then, and then the question that you said that I think is very important. And the thing I'll add is... What was it that I was saying? I think some, another thing I would suggest, just in this sense, is You, you spoke about the tendency to measure in terms of how comfortable we feel. And there can be other measurements that just come in that are actually, they're quite narrow. How focused was I? How much thinking was there versus how much did I stay with breath? And it can be so easy to get sucked into a narrow measurement of how did I do. So another approach that I would suggest is actually intentionally thinking and counting all the qualities that you have developed, patience, improvisation, trust, meta, sensitivity to what's going on, you know, tons of things, attunement, wise response, patience, you're developing so much and it can be very easy for the mind to just get stuck on one thing because that's the thing that you can count very easily, you know, it's like how much money do you have? It's very easy to count, so that's the thing that the mind will tend to like, you know, but is that actually the most important thing? You know? The mind will count what's easiest to count, not, not necessarily what's most important, so it's really helpful to expand the case. And I'll just echo something you said, if health is, is important among, among other things that were important. Um, my teacher sometimes he would quote, I think it's from, from the 
from the Christian Bible, not from the, the, the Jewish Bible. Uh, by your fruits you shall know them. So it's a little bit like, how do you know if meditation is working? You need to really get into it. And then see how it shows in the life, you know? Yeah. And there will be a difference if you're doing it reasonably correctly. There will be a significant difference. You know? And if it got into a kind of wrong route, you, you, you look at the life and you'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you to everyone for your really intelligent and sensitive, very deeply personal questions. Really appreciate that. Yeah. So, should we just sit together for a moment to the end of the day? May your breath serve you in the short and long term. May it serve your deepest, deepest aspiration and may it serve all beings. so much and you can just meditate and it's very possible that you won't be tired you know? so the level of concern that comes with uh, and the not falling asleep you can let it go to probably really be fine we'll be here tomorrow morning at seven seven mm-hmm. wow <laughs> <laughs> <Of> the latest <laughs>